Yeah. So in studying this, what what I found out is that trauma and anxiety are actually genetic. We think of our eye color and hair color as being inherited, but it isn't until the last few decades that we've realized we inherit trauma and anxiety. They studied this with descendants from Holocaust survivors, where there's this, you know, hypervigilance to survival when there's no presence of that in their real life. Welcome to Out of the Box with Christine. Are you willing to step into your greatness? Are you ready to shine? Well, get ready, Truth Seeker. You're in for an amazing ride. And now, here's the host of the show, Christine Blasdale. Welcome back to... Wait, excuse me. <laughs> Welcome back to Out of the Box with Christine. I am your host, Christine Blasdale, your expert authority, business coach, helping entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, and just about everybody else get their message out to the world in a fun, unusual way. And I am super excited about today's show because a dear friend of mine is is joining us. And what she's doing for the world is so powerful. I, I had to have her back on the show. She's been on the show before. You can look for that archive somewhere. But today I've got on Laura Rhodes Levin, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist who specializes in anxiety, depression, and trauma. She's also the brand new author of The Missing Piece, Rewire Your Brain, Reduce Anxiety, and Recreate Your Life. And I'm so happy to have you back, Laura Rhodes Levin. Welcome. So glad to be back. I am a Blasdale fan. I, <laughs> I bring so much joy and spontaneity to my life on a regular basis. Whenever I see your face pop up on my screen, I my eyeballs and ears open and I go for a little ride. So thank you for making me part of one oh. of the rides. I, you know what, the time we've spent together and, and Laura was actually also one of my clients, my podcast coaching clients. And she has a podcast, by the way. Also, we'll make sure we put a link to that in the show notes so people can, can get access to that as well as a link to get your book, The Missing Piece, but it's called The Missing Piece yeah. or Anxiety, right? So I'm just, I'm so proud of you, of all the stuff that you've been doing and all the work that you've been doing. It's, it's amazing, but welcome back to the show as well. So you've been a little busy the last yeah. week. <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about what you've got going on? Sure. So I run an anxiety center called the Missing Peace Center for Anxiety. And it's not like the Shel Silverstein piece. It's P-E-A-C-E, -E, like peace of mind. And I've also started a mental health charity that operates for the Missing Peace. So for people who couldn't, afford to come or didn't have the insurance. And that's called the FEW Foundation, Pathways for Health and Emotional Wellness. And as someone who struggled deeply with anxiety since I was born, I've studied anxiety. I've tried all sorts of things like drugs and alcohol that didn't work. Well, they were temporarily, but certainly not long-term. And in forming my center over the last decade, I have so many people say to me, oh my God, there's nothing like this. Will you, will, you should open one in New York or you should open one in Brentwood or you should. And I'm like, I don't want to be Borders. I just want to be a little bookstore in Maine. You know, I, I, I can't teach people how to manage their anxiety and then just totally spread myself thin. So I thought, all right, well, if I wrote a book, if I wrote a book, then the word could get out. My tools and my ideas could be all over the place while I sit comfortably in my comfy office. <laughs> so fireplace. I wrote the book. Right. Fireplace going, all that. Well, and and as as a fellow author, I know it's there's it's such a great feeling. I don't because I like to create. As you know, I'm a creator, right? Yeah, I like are. to create podcasts and videos and TikToks and books and courses and all of that. But once you do that book 
And when somebody reaches out to you who's read it and they say, I, I got you, I got it. I understood what you were saying, or they'll, they'll, re- they'll re- refer to something that you've written. That feeling is like, Oh my gosh, you got it. You know, because as a writer or as a, as a creator, you put it out there and you hope people get it. Right. But when they give you that feedback, it's just the best feeling in the world. It is. And, you know, I get it. In my younger years, I did comedy and, you know, making someone laugh or having someone tell you, oh, my God, you cracked me up. Always. It was the greatest high I ever had. And so I didn't actually think of that now till you just said it like someone coming up and saying, wow, I read that chapter. And wow, that's just such a wonderful, exciting idea. Wow. Well, and especially since I mean, this, like the stuff I do on TikTok, people might say, "Oh, you made me laugh," but the stuff you do really changes people's lives. I mean, it's like we're dealing with some, you know, as the subtitle says, "We rewire your brain, reduce anxiety, and recreate your life." Anxiety and depression, man, there's a lot of that. <laughs> it's a lot. There is people. People are going through a lot, and it's not, and it's not something that's just temper you know not just oh it's from the covid days we're talking about a lot of times people being born with anxiety like you were saying being born or having those those wires of anxiety since the very earliest memories Can you talk a, a bit about that and your experience personally yeah so in studying this what what i found out is that trauma and anxiety are actually genetic We think of our eye color and hair color as being inherited, but it isn't until the last few decades that we've realized we inherit trauma and anxiety. They studied this with descendants from Holocaust survivors, where there's this, you know, hypervigilance to survival when there's no presence of that in their real life. And so I wonder why at four, I living, you know, in Tarzana in a suburb that I thought there was a bear in the closet and that I was about to be kidnapped. And, you know, just all these fears that developed in this really innocent brain. And so I've had a chance to go back through my own family history. And the first chapter is is called the trauma baton. It's it's about mm. how it just gets passed along from generation to generation. And then the buck really can stop where you are. It doesn't have to be passed on over and over and over again because we can rewire our brains. And so then we're rewiring what we're passing on. And those neural pathways that are dug so deep so that that the bear in the closet type scenario that we relive over and over and over and over again that that those canals get so deep that that's the go-to right so that if 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 you're in traffic and somebody honks at you ah there's the bear in the closet you know the, right. and that response because it's you're that's where you go so how rewiring the brain how do you do that <laughs> well believe it or not it's actually it's more about making a habit of rewiring your brain. So our brains are very programmable. If you have to wake up at six in the morning every day for work, you got a new job, you have to wake up at six. For the first few weeks, it's hard. But after a while, on a Saturday, you're waking up at six. You wired your brain to do that. So recognizing how your brain goes to that negative bias, how it goes to worst case scenarios automatically, and then replacing it with different thoughts. It's not enough to just say, don't think that. (laughs) Don't think of the elephant. (laughs) Right? Right. Uh, You can't just go, it's, there's no bear in the closet. Relax. (laughs) You have to say, listen to the music. Can you hear, you know, the, the, can you feel the moonlight on your face? Can you, can you hear your kitty cat purring? Like actually redirecting what you're used to connecting with is what changes your experience in the world and your frequency, right? Mm -hmm. So you change your whole radio station and now you're getting life on a completely different dimension than where you started off on. And as we're talking about, especially with anxiety, there's 
you have the generational trauma, which I do want to come back to because man, oh man, that's, that's <laughs> really big. And I think nobody really pays attention to that or doesn't understand that that's, that's what happens. But also folks with uh, neurodiversities as far, as far as ADHD. And I know, I know someone personally with ADHD and anxiety is like her middle name. Right. But then also pe- people with autism as well. I mean, my goodness, do you have many clients that 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 are diagnosed with ADHD or autism and or autism? So many, so many. And in fact, one of the best forms of equipment I have here is called neurofeedback. And neurofeedback is the number one recommended treatment by the American Pediatric Academy for ADD and ADHD. And the particular version that I use, the Offmer method, was designed by neuroscientists who had an autistic son and wow. wanted to help him out. And and a lot of what we do at the center is rather than looking at any of these as a quote disability, this is your special gift, man. This is that we just have to take that special energy and and we you can either go Jedi or you can go Darth Vader and we're we're going Jedi. The the planet creates us to be exactly who we are because that's what the planet needed. And once we realize that blending in is the last thing we need to do. And when we take all our pain and and we realize it seasons our unique recipe then we can serve ourselves up with joy and excitement and and to people who really get it people who you know and not everyone's going to be your flavor but they're not your flavor either so it's it works out really well so all these things that the big big pharma wants to label us with and give us pills for and medicate that's just part of you, your special you and how does that work for you in society, as a person, in your heart, in your soul. And that's the recreate your life part, right? Is is finding your your personal true purpose. Because there's only one Christine Bra- Blasdale. That's right. Only one. <laughs> only one. And we don't want 30. We want you. We want to come to you specifically. No one can be Christine Blasdale like you can. And that's true of everyone in the whole entire world. Yes. And and that is such a big, and that is a challenge for those that do have ADHD or autism. It's well with autism. A lot of times it's that masking to try and fit in. And with ADHD, a lot of times that can be the comparing with other people, you know, other people do this, other people do that. And you know, why am I struggling with this? (laughs) I've, I've also, with with folks with ADHD, I've I've heard it be compared to as well, like having you know on your computer when you have a lot of tabs open, mm-hmm. right? You're yeah, doing, you're totally. Doing, I always say I think that multitasking is like an incredible talent because <laughs> I I'm pretty much I like to focus on one thing, get it done, and then go to the next thing. But I my my wife has many tabs open and she can multitask like nobody's business, but when you're in that self-critical phase that can be a detriment right or that can be seen as something that's not good yeah um, so i love what you're talking about with this it was a, a, a neural feedback is that what you were saying it was neural feedback eeg biofeedback that's that's a whole story it's it's you it's the opportunity for your brain to experience itself and it's a very brilliant technology that's used by NASA, the armed forces, sports teams, you know, because when you're in your head, you you can't make the shot. But but going back to what you said about multitasking, if I may, yeah. I, you know, I'm always learning as I am teaching. And I used to pride myself. I'm probably more like your wife of like, oh, I can multitask. I can do this. And what I'm realizing is that while I have the ability to do that, I don't care for the energy in my body that it Mm. takes to do that. I'm not speaking of your wife, but for me personally, I want to be calm and peaceful. And that's part of the 
thing about having all the the windows open, what a great analogy, all the tabs open. Another one of my chapters is true peace is learning what to ignore. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's powerful. <laughs> Yeah. You can have a bunch of tabs open, but that doesn't mean you have to attend to all of them yeah. at one time. You, it is, it's your grace, it's your right, it's it's your own inner peace to just focus in on what's what's important to you in that moment and learn how to quiet the noise from all the other channels until until you're ready, because then you're really using a hundred percent of your brain all the time. Right, if you're doing three things at once. You really are only using 33.3% of your brain to do each task. It's and it and then there's the pressure. So there's the pressure to do it right. And if you don't do it right, then that judgmental anxiety too that comes on as well. It's that's that's yeah. the challenge, right? Because you're well, it, and the energy you have to drum up to do it all. Yes. Yeah. I makes me want to take a nap. <laughs> right. <laughs> Exactly. And sometimes that's what I do. Like if I'm overwhelmed, like if there's a situation and I, I plot myself, I'm the turtle, you know, I'm, I'm not the rabbit. I'm the turtle. I'll, I'll, I'll plot myself out and I'll go, right. Okay. I'll look at my day and I'll go, well, I have this. I can, oh, that's, that's pretty jumbled. Okay. We got a lot of stuff going on here, but then I, it's not that I'll take a physical nap. Sometimes I will. I'll just go, I got to go lay down. I got to go lay down. But, but other times I'll take a mental nap. And the yeah. mental nap is, look, I've got two hours in between this crazy stuff and then this other somewhat crazy stuff. And for those two hours, I am not going to do anything productive, <laughs> whatever yeah. that is, right? So it might be, I love, gro- I, I love going to the grocery store. I go to the grocery store and I just walk down the aisles, you know? And I yeah. and I shop because it's from COVID times because we weren't able to do anything. And so all I could do was go to the two grocery stores that we have here. And that was it. It was like I was I was allowed to go to the grocery stores. So that's my treat is I'll go to yeah. the grocery store and I'll just like look around, look at the products and look at the ingredients and go, is that really good for me? Yeah. So that's my little mental nap that I do. Well, and the tortoise in the story wins the race. But I think that the the hare could modify its behavior and just like, instead of running back and forth like a lunatic, just run ahead, <laughs> stop, hydrate, meditate, run some more, you, you know, right? <laughs> Your pace, just, just, <laughs> just, just don't know. go back and forth, <laughs> right? All over the place to so, prove something. Yeah. It, well, yeah. And. That's what we have. Mo- we all have moments like that. I think we all have those moments where we push ourselves a bit too much. Now, p- part of the puzzle is, of course, is the anxiety. Uh, but another aspect and, uh, and of the generational trauma that we have is depression. And I know that people younger and younger, we're talking teens, preteens, kids are depressed. Man, and I don't rem- I hate to sound like my grandmother, but I don't remember this happening when I'm sure it was there. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure it was there, but I don't remember it in the um, large amounts of what we have today, especially with teenagers and pre- preteens to teenagers with depression. What's what's happening? What's going on, Laura? You know, our frontal cortex and we revere it so much that brilliant frontal cortex our thinking part it has not had the same chance to develop as much as the rest of our brain Mm -hmm. and we think we're so modern on our hoverboards and we're you know (laughs) on our phones and we're doing this and our brains are and our bodies have not caught up with the lifestyle that we've created. And especially with with younger people. I mean, I don't know when when I was little at like two, the big toy was the that little that ball, that plastic ball that pulled apart and all yeah. the yellow came out. Yeah. And you put, put the shapes in like woo. <laughs> and we have something called brain fog in that our brains just don't 
have a chance to rest anymore. They're just constantly going. And like I was talking about with the multitasking, it evokes that fight flight response. When you're trying to do all this stuff, you have to dump adrenaline and cortisol into your body Mm. to keep up that kind of pace. It's not good for our brains. It stops the manufacturing of dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin and all those feel-good neurotransmitters. And on top of it, our our bodies are not experienced. You know, we used to have to like go out and collect lavender and hunt mammoth and do all this stuff in, in our effort to become comfortable, which I'm guilty. I love my couch. I love my TV. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. But we're not naturally getting those endorphins that we got from just being out in nature. And the biggest piece, I think, is we are social beings. One mm-hmm. of the best neurotransmitters in the body is called oxytocin. It's the love neurotransmitter. It's what you get when you hug someone. It's what's exchanged between a mommy and a baby. And you cannot get that through your phone. Mm. And and it's why COVID had such a drastic impact on people because we were isolated. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And so we need each other. We need to dance and be in circles and and laugh and and just be together. And, And so much of technology has created the illusion of togetherness. But it's not the physical experience. So our brains and our emotions are just, they're not in sync anymore. And it's happening younger and younger. And I noticed that too with 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 our our teenagers as well, was that I could slowly, well, slowly, quickly see them just not not doing well. And not just with the COVID thing, because everybody was was panicking and freaking out and everything right everybody but what happened was also was that all of their whole entire life was just funneled through this thing yeah so school social interactions they thought that they knew people that they thought they had relationships with people that were on the screen right right and so much to the point where it becomes an addiction that, yeah. that that this cannot that's be the only dopamine you're getting you're getting some rush. It's my drug. Yeah. So so I'm gonna sleep with my drug. I'm going to wake up to my drug. I'm gonna go to the bathroom with my drug. I'm gonna make sure that I got my drug on. You know, if you if you've ever got left the house and you don't have your phone on you, right? Yeah. And I'm a, I'm almost 60 years old and I've I've I'm a, I'm a wise woman. But man, I'll tell you, I go out to my car and I don't have, I'm like, what, where, where, where to go? So imagine right. a, you know, 15, 16 year old because well, their I whole think, world is in that device. Yes. And it's not, I think more than even drug, because I think that's what's getting, it, it is, I need my neurotransmitters. I need my feel good connection to my brain. And so it's not just the same as cocaine. It's. It's literally the the feeling of connection. And, you know, I've said this before, but for kids, teenagers, you take them out of school for two years and they don't get a chance to grow socially, emotionally. So you take a 14-year-old, you keep him at home for two years. Now he's 16. You put him back in school. But guess what? He's still 14. Yeah. He's still emotionally 14. 14 years old. And expected to be, you know, ready to go to prom. And it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. but I don't mean to sound like a, a nihilist either, because yeah, all this stuff is present, but there's still so much opportunity to connect to the earth, to the planet, to your friends, to your family, to your true, true self. And to have that as your goal, it's awesome. And I, th- I think part of it too is also being aware of the self-loathing, self, self-loathing, 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 mm-hmm. self, self-hatred, self-loathing that is very prevalent. And I, and I 
what's it's fueled a lot of times by this by the technology in the devices because also there's that that comparison model as well right well look at all these people they look like they're having fun and w- why is my life boring or you know those things yeah. but there's also and and i think even even without the technology and you were talking about this a little bit about that generational trauma that a lot of us are born into a world of trauma and we've carried those generational traumas. So there is a bit of self-loathing. It's not just fear. It's not just that fear. It's also, I don't like who I am or what I am. Right. Mm-hmm. And not knowing why really. Right. And, and it comes from dysfunctional parenting mm-hmm. that came from dysfunctional parenting. I mean, with with my grandmother, she was chased by Cossacks and her mother was killed in front of her. And so Ooh. she goes and she grabs my my uh, mother and won't let her out of her sight and hits her with pots and pans every time she leaves the house. So then my mother lets us know, oh, my God, there's kidnappers out there. And she screams and yells and she hits with brushes instead of pots and pans. So that's evolution, right? <laughs> and it's all meant believe it or not, from love, but it's just such an ignorant expression. And self-actualization, like we've only in the last several decades got asked survival. We need a roof over our head. We need, we need, you know, food and shelter. And many of us are still struggling with that. But we want these dynamic relationships full of love and understanding and, and, most often we do not hear what other people say. When when I have couples on the couch, I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa, what did you hear when she said that? Because I've had a, a couple come in and say, you know, he walks in and he's like, oh, you look good in pink. And she's like, I know. Thanks a lot. Never mind that. And I'm like, whoa, what did, <laughs> what did you hear? When he said, you look good in pink. And she said, he's bad. I bought a blouse. And I was like, whoa, okay. (laughs) And so we do interpret things so. Through our own filters. Another reason why I don't like texting is. Yeah. I'm okay in a text. You don't know if that's, I'm okay. Or I'm okay. Those are very different things. And so it is about reinterpreting what our own inner critic is telling us, exactly. you know, Oh, he looked at me. Oh, I better look at my clothes. I'm not good enough. I'm not whatever. And probably that other person is looking and going, Oh, she's prettier than I am. You know, it's like yep. all these little hurt feelings and, and emotions are open wounds that people, I shouldn't say emotions are open wounds. Emotional wounds are invisible. And so someone can brush by you and say something that is completely traumatizing to you, but they can't see your emotional wounds. And they just thought they walked by and the wind blew in your direction. And you're like, oh, how could you do that? Right, right. So, you know, at the root of it, corny, it's true, self-love. Boom. Shine your beautiful light. And the people who are meant to bask in that light will shine their beautiful lights back on you and avoid the energy suckers. How do we how do we how do we spread that message of self-love, Laura? Other than people getting your book. <laughs> but <laughs> no, seriously, no, seriously um, like, it's we need to teach this. This is is this something we need to teach the little kids? Absolutely. It's not absolutely. happening at home. It's we don't really understand what self-care is. We don't really understand what mindfulness is. And, you know, I hear so often people say with pride, I'm harder on myself than anyone. Why? Please do not do that to yourself. The, the one of, again, one of my chapters is called the inner critic. And it's, it's connected to the outcast because we really primitively believe if we're cast out, We will die. We need our clan to survive. And so we're very critical of ourselves. And it does not work, people. It doesn't. It doesn't work. If you have a little kid next to you who can't do well well in math, you don't say, well, you're an idiot. 
and you're never going to get good at math. So give it up now and, you know, just call it a day, pal. You need to say you're so close. You're going to get it. You're, you're, you're going to get it. But, and saying this to yourself, because here's the thing, whatever you are thinking about yourself, in whichever way you are judging yourself, you are judging others and you believe they are judging you with the same voice that's in your head. And that's the radio station that you're on. It sucks. It's music you don't want to listen to. It's music. It, oh, it's, I don't know what it is. It's like, hey, and it takes time, right? You're in that. This is such an old school thing to say, because in the old days, radios, you change stations and you heard like, <laughs> right? that's the growing part. The, but when you really do start being kind to yourself and you know how to be kind to yourself, that's what comes into your life. People are kind to you and because that's what you demand in the most loving way. And people who aren't, you're like, ah, these are not the droids you're looking for. You just, you just keep going. Yeah. Next. Um, <laughs> that's what I say. Go next. next. Yeah. Next. Exactly. And it is so much of that. Like you were saying that, that, well, that signal that you, that you're sending out, that's harsh self-critical self-loathing signal it attracts it's it's a powerful yes. energy energy is powerful and you can tell it's as soon as physics as it's soon as somebody physics. comes in the door you can also as soon as somebody walks into the door you can tell you, their energy they don't have to say anything it's the exactly. energy yeah and exactly. so that's oh my goodness we have so much work to do laura to heal but the that's world the fun of it that's why we're here we're here to do this work we're we're here to learn how to love this life and and find joy in it. And so if there were no work, you know, we it, it would be kind of boring. We we get our light from our darkness. And you know what I I really truly also really love about you is that you like me, you like to learn as, as you learn you share those experiences with others. So you're on a journey. You're not some holier than thou therapist who's like, okay, like sitting with the couch. <laughs> Tell me. Yes, exactly. How was your childhood? <laughs> <laughs> right. You're like, you're like, yeah, you know what? I've got a bear in my closet when I was a kid. And I, you know, you're, 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 I just love that you're co-creating and you're co-healing with people with your beautiful clients, right? That it's a journey that you're taking together instead of this authoritarian, authoritarian sort of, you know, thing. Yeah. It just, it's just so beautiful. And, 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 and more and more people should be doing that in their, in their respective fields. I don't, it doesn't matter if you're a teacher or if you're a therapist or you're a media coach, Have, having that sort of journey and connection with people is so powerful. I'm so happy for you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so, I'm just, just delighted that you you come on the show today and that you've got this great new book. So the uh, the full title again is I'll show you. Can I do that? Yes. For those that are watching on YouTube, you can see this. And if you're listening to the podcast, you can go to YouTube and you can actually see the cover of the book. The missing piece. Rewire your brain, reduce anxiety and recreate your life by Laura Rhodes Levin. Ah. And if you are ordering on Amazon, it keeps changing peace, P-E-A-C-E to P-I-E-C-E. -E. So just put in my name, Laura Rhodes Levin, the missing piece, and then the book will come up. You can I'll put a link in the show notes. They don't even have to search. All they have to do is click that Perfect. link. They'll get, they'll get to you. They'll get to you. And also we'll put a link to your website as well. So people can find out more about the, the work that you do and thank get in you. touch with you. So thank you again, Laura. Thank you so much for being oh, with me. I adore me you. <laughs> I adore you too. And thank you so much for having me and have a beautiful everything. <laughs> thank you, my love. Thank you. And I want to thank you wonderful listeners and viewers who are watching on YouTube. If you want to subscribe to the podcast, you can on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the major platforms, Audible, Amazon. And um, I encourage you to also subscribe to the YouTube channel because then you can see my lovely guests 
Laura Rhodes Levin, and all the great guests that we have here on Out of the Box with Christine. If you want more information about uh, me and the coaching I do, go to christineblasdale.com. If you want more information about the show, out of the box with Christine.com. All of those links will be in the show notes, so you don't have to travel anywhere. Just click those links and you'll get to where you want to go. And oh my God, next- if you want to learn how to do a podcast, go to Christine. <laughs> I've got a good story to tell you about that. I'll, I'll tell you after we get off this off the show. Um, uh, as I always say to wonderful uh, listeners and subscribers, remember to always think outside that damn box. Bye for now. <laughs>